This episode of The Michael Shermer Show is brought to you by Brilliant, the learning platform designed to be uniquely effective in helping you learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and artificial intelligence. For example, Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data, all of which uses real-world data to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions. This is perfect for learners of any level to start and continue learning data analysis with a full built-out suite of new content from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regression. You all have heard me talk about Bayesian reasoning here uh, on this show and in my books and so on. This is really, really important to understand how to think about what's true in the world. And through Brilliant, you can learn how to parse and visualize massive data sets to make them easier to interpret. You can gain insight by working with real data sets from sources like Starbucks, Twitter, X, Spotify, and more. Try it out. Go to brilliant.org slash skeptic, and you'll get a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription. Check it out, brilliant.org slash skeptic. All right, here's the show. I loved your book because it touches on so many of uh, deep topics about mind and consciousness and intelligence and the nature of the self and, you know, what we are as humans, if we can create something that resembles us and so on. So just give us a little bit of background of, you know, how you got interested in this particular topic and related topics that uh, you wrote about previously in your previous books. Well, this specific topic I got interested in as I was wrapping up uh, my last book, Beyond Human, which is about uh, converging technologies in medicine that are creating all kinds of implants, chips, and things, you know, technology that can be put into the body that works in concert with the body and, uh, and how these can sometimes enhance, uh, enhance as well as cure disease. Um, but I kept running across, in, in my research, I kept running across different articles about caregiving robots, robots that were taking care of sick people, disabled people, people with dementia, um, that weren't just simply utilitarian. They also provided companionship. So these are social robots. And that was a revelation to me uh, that such a thing existed in because it just kept coming up in the context of health care, which is an area that I've written about a lot that I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, it, it, it just it, it came up so many times that I said, you know what, at the end of this, my next book is going to be on social robots. So I did, and I just dove in, and it's just been an incredible uh, journey. I do that. Usually my next book is whatever I wrote about in the final chapter of the previous book. <laughs> uh, uh, also, when the previous book gets too long and you have to start cutting, you can just save the material for, for another book. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so on this Beyond Human thing, so you're talking about things like cochlear implants or those chips they put in the uh, motor cortex of Parkinson's patients, things like that? Uh, yes, all the way up to artificial organs, which are in development in, in universities around the country. Um, you, you know, artificial kidneys, there is an artificial heart that's actually been implanted into a few thousand people at this point worldwide. Um, and, and there's just a lot of technology coming down the pike in medicine, which I find very, very interesting. And I think the reason that robots and it's social robot. robots are going to become commonly used uh, consumer items is because they're coming to people at three junctures in their life that already exist. So healthcare and caregiving is one of those, and it's a big one. And I think uh, there's a big role for social robots in that uh, particular area. Yeah, let's start off by defining a robot. What do you mean? A robot is an artificial technological being that has no biological, to this point so far, has no biological components um, that's in, that is uh, n not necessarily embodied, uh, but that contains its software intelligence and deep learning intelligence 
um, that allows it to interact with people and do a lot of things, a lot of amazing things uh, that robots can do. Now, even chatbots are doing a lot of amazing things. So um, that's that's a robot. It's essentially an artificial being, uh, but the design is roughly approximately based on human beings. So human intelligence is kind of the model. I see. So my Tesla is not a robot. Some people would say that your Tesla is a robot uh, yeah. and, and, and a non-autonomous robot because you, you, the driver, are interacting with the whole the system, you know, presumably the whole time uh, that the car is moving. So, um, but yes, yeah, some people would say that's a robot. Hmm. Because you use the word being, so I guess then the next question is, what do you mean by be a, a being? Well, that is a whole other conversation. Uh, that's that's a deep well, one. Well, let's have it. <laughs> I know this is this is what you're touching on. That's why I liked your book. Yeah. When, what do you mean when, by being? Well, I mean there are certain qualities that come to mind when I think of the word being. You know, one of them is individuality. One of them is uh, a level of intelligence. Uh, and uh, it goes far beyond that. But I would say those are like the basic rudimentary uh, things that would go into a being. And, and it's a very basic word that's used a lot in philosophy. And, um, it, you know, it's something that I think is being defined and redefined uh, as our technology advances. Because, and especially in the case of robots that are childhood and that are are interactive with human beings and that learn on their own. Um, I say again, we're creating new categories of being, and we will as we go forward, the more sophisticated the technology becomes. Mm. Okay, then how do you distinguish a robot from a social robot or social emotional robot? What do you mean by that? A social robot is equipped to, to be conversational. Um, so it speaks, it, it can uh, mimic, uh, you know, certain rudimentary parts of human uh, behavior, like making eye contact and, um, you know, moving its head to follow your gaze and things like that. Um, that's, that's a robot um, that is, um, you know, also able to converse with you and able to process language when you speak to it, and the only interface with this and between you and the robot is language. So you're not programming something on a keyboard, you're just telling the robot, do this, give me that, look up this. And that robot is learning very intricately what your interests are, uh, what you, uh, you know, would like to pursue, what your tastes. Uh, your personality is catered to on a very, very specific level by these robots. And they can develop over time a very exquisite level of compatibility to you. And that's what makes these, uh, these relationships with them so captivating and so, in a lot of ways, addictive for people. Hmm. Right. So, a Roomba is not a social robot. It's really um, the apparent caring for somebody. And I say apparent because uh, I've never interacted with one of these robots. I, I, I would just imagine I would be delusional to think that it cares about me. But maybe, maybe if it's intelligent enough and it gives off enough cues, I don't know, it smiles, it stares at me, it taps, taps me on the shoulder or, or, or pats me on the back or something, I would feel that all of a sudden. This is what, you have a whole chapter on the uncanny valley. Maybe mm -hmm. that's a good segue into that problem. It is, and in, in the thing we're talking about, what you're talking about and what, I, and, and what the uncanny valley is about uh, really has more to do with our emotional and social hardwiring, you know, because we all like to think that we would not be taken in by a robot. We, there's no way we would even, you know, consent to have an artificial relationship. It's just ridiculous. But this, the research shows something very different. So 
our emotions, emotions and our social nature are say something very different. And that is that we are easily captivated. We're easily drawn in. And I mean, I think you can see through this stuff in news stories about the uh, chat GPT and some of these chat bots. There are a couple of situations where the engineers who train them, who design them and, and train them, um, were kind of spooked by some development that the chat bot was able to, you know, do it, it conversationally. And, you know, the, it's, it's very seductive and it's, and we're all vulnerable to it at every age, every, you know, level of education. It doesn't really matter because studies have been done on this and, and, uh, people are very vulnerable to it. Now, on the question of the Uncanny Valley, that's another reaction that is uh, pretty much universal. Uh, it, um, it, it transcends cultures and geography and, and all those things. And it is just uh, a reaction that people have uh, when they're interacting with a robot or any technological artifact that appears to be human. But at the same time, on some subtle level or some level, betrays its artificiality. So if you were talking to a robot and it was like super realistic and um, you were really drawn in by it, and then all of a sudden there's a glitch in the speech pattern, but uh, it would light up a little electrical storm in your mind, in your brain, um, that leads to a feeling of fear and uh, creepiness, uh, and, and even some revulsion. Uh, and that's just something that we, we're hardwired for. And, it, and it's a tough problem for link bodices because they need to overcome this if robots are going to become household items. Yeah, so this has been studied uh, cross-culturally and for a long time that people have this revulsive reaction to a robot that's close, but not close enough. Mm -hmm. It's true. And, and they've actually looked at people's brains uh, using functional MRI imaging when they're actually uh, uh, interacting with a robot. And there is a uncanny valley reaction and looking at what's happening in the brain and what, what the interpretation of all that data is that uh, the certain lines get crossed in your mind as to whether the robot is living, not living, alive, dead. You know, that's a very spooky, murky area for people and for human psychology. And it has deep roots in, in psychology. So it's, it's, a, it's a reaction that just is irresistible. It's a reflex, I should say. It's, yeah, you have this. Great description here from psychologists Kurt Gray and Daniel Wagner. After studying the responses of 43 research subjects who viewed two videos, one in which a robot was extremely lifelike and one in which the robot's inner workings were clearly visible, suggested that feelings of uncanniness are driven by an attribution of mind to human-like robots. But when we attribute mind to robots, we're still basically ignorant of what type of mind a robot might have. If we fail to sufficiently anthropomorphize them, it's easy to imagine that the robot mind is alien, inscrutable, and possibly dangerous. Yeah. Uh, oh, you, you, and then you quote them, the hallmark of humanity is our minds. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. So, <laughs> but, you know, if we, let's just think about what we are. We are molecular machines. <clears throat> Super complicated, and it's a wet, it's a wet lab, as it were. It's a wet machine. But it's still a machine. You know, if you think about how cells operate, how neurons operate, their electrical, chemical signaling devices. Um, you know, at some point, if computers just get ever, or these robots get ever more complicated, it, it's not just their responses, but the, I guess the details of, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the, the reactions they have to us that are indistinguishable from talking to a person, then the uncanny valley would be crossed, right? Well, it would be crossed, and uh, it actually is getting crossed more and more, increasingly. Uh, it, we're moving in that direction with the technology, the way the technology is advancing. 
Um, but I think the thing that we, you know, more than anything that, that is kind of captivating us, it's the intelligence of the being and the assumptions that we make about it and how we interpret its behavior. Because there are, there are different there are different views of whether or not robots or computers or any technology will ever be conscious. There's, it, it's, it's an unresolved question, and it's one of the biggest questions in science. Um, so, you know, we don't know what's going on in the mind of the robot. We know that something's going on. If it became conscious, would we know it? Would we understand it? You know, would we understand the type of mind? Because we have engineers who work with algorithms and create them, and they don't understand how algorithms come to their conclusions and how they make decisions. So, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, again, that's you're touching on one of the, the deep subjects, the problem of other minds. You know, how do I know you're sentient? And... And I you don't, don't know. but the answer is, I, I don't know for sure. <laughs> However, here's how I resolve this issue. You know, I apply the Copernican principle. We're not special to myself. I'm not special. So there's a pretty good chance that your brain is wired up the same way as mine is and that your red probably looks like my red and your emotions of sadness or, or, or joy or, or, or whatever feel the same way as mine do, more or less. Uh, and that's a reasonable assumption. And I think, I guess the question would be if, you know, if a robot was like Data on Star Trek, you know, where it was just played by, you know, Brett Spinner, the actor, um, you know, that it, it, essentially it's close enough that, you know, viewers have crossed the uncanny valley and accept Data and, and love Data. And he's, you know, one of the beloved characters in all science fiction, you know, uh, that, that, that would be it for me. It's like, yeah, that, he's mm -hmm. a sentient being. Uh, close enough. I, I don't know for sure. And then the other problem, this uh, uh, why I don't think it's solvable at all, that, that is the hard problem of consciousness. That is what it's like to be the wiring. You know, whether you're, you're wet wiring like we have or you're a robot with whatever your wiring is, it, we can't know. I can't know what it's like to be your wiring, <laughs> it, you know, in the, same, in the same way as I just said. So the same thing with the robot. You know, like with, you know, did, I like to ask, did Watson know that it beat the great Ken Jennings in Jeopardy? Well, it doesn't mm. even know it's playing Jeopardy, <laughs> right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, you could program it to say, yay, I won, I beat Ken Jennings. <laughs> but that would just be a program. Uh, you know, uh, I guess the question would be, uh, would it ever feel the joy of having won Jeopardy? What would that even mean? We're not anywhere close to that now technologically, and I don't know if we'll ever get there. It's an open question. Um, you know, robots uh, can't... The, the limitation that we have right now with robots, essentially with their minds, is that they really only have about... There, is that there are many types of intelligence. There are several types of intelligence in the human side of things. Uh, robots you have two of these. They have uh, linguistic intelligence and they have logical computational intelligence. So humans, on the other hand, have many other types of intelligence. There's emotional intelligence, there's moral intelligence, there's kinetic, there's musical, there's creative. Um, for robots to get to the point that we would consider them alive on, on, on par with a human being, I think, would take a different kind of technology than we have right now, not just more computational power. How, you know, we'd say that we need a difference in kind, not just, uh, you know, adding more into the same category that they're already very good at. So, you know, it's all of this is open ended. It's, it's, a, it's all very, fluid and developments are taking place very rapidly all around the world uh, with robots and AI and uh, deep learning and, uh, and, and the capabilities that, uh, as far as what robots can do, sensors, you know, cloud computing, uh, you know, the audio, uh, things like that, the movement, 
that those things are proceeding very, very quickly. But until we have a mind and a robot that kind of to us convinces us that it's as multifaceted as a human mind and is capable on as many different levels as a as a human mind, um, it's going to be hard for us to believe that they're conscious. Certainly yeah. hard to prove. Oh. <laughs> yes, right. I, I, so is it your sense we're a long ways away from that, or, or not just you know five years away and always will be, as the joke is, but that the research isn't even going in that direction? I mean, that... It, in other words, why would a robot want something or have an, an emotion like desire? So you have like companion, uh, social companion robots or caretaker robots and, and, you know, sex robots. But, you know, part of the joy of sex is that the other person wants to be with you, that enjoys the process with you. I, I just can't imagine that the programmed robots that would be doing this or the caretaker or whatever that is caring for me in my dotage <laughs> actually feels inside like they care about me. And, and uh, I gather what you're saying is that's not going to happen at the current uh, um, kind of research that's being done uh, R and D on it with these companies. I don't see anything myself right now, but you know, again, as I say, you know, rapidly emerging developments every day of the week, practically. Um, I don't see it, though, to be honest and to be practical about this whole thing. I think maybe 50 years from now, maybe it will be possible. If it's ever possible, it may not yeah. ever be possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, we evolved emotions as proxies for driving behavior in a certain direction. Robots are not evolving to want anything. They're just programmed. So give us an example of, from your research of, like, a caretaker robot. What can they do? Can, you know, can they make me breakfast? Can they make oh, the bed? <laughs> they what can do they do? do? They can do a lot of things now. Um, they can uh, pick you up from the bed and put you in a wheelchair and vice versa. Oh, wow. uh, they can help you dress. They can bathe you. Um, obviously, they can manage your health uh, you know, routine by you know, bringing you medicines and reminding you when it's time to do an, uh, do an exercise, perhaps. Uh, they can manage your health. As far as, you know, uh, the materials development, uh, we're gonna, this is going to get much more abled uh, when soft materials become widespread in robots. And those are under development right now. We have soft materials that look and resemble skin um, and that are, are soft to the touch. And robots are being much better at modulating their strength so when they lift a frail person out of bed, so to speak, they don't break a bone or something by, by applying the wrong amount of pressure. Um, so mm. this is coming, and, and it's a key area of research because there's such a crying need for caregiving robots. And, I mean, in this country and in many other countries, we have a, a severe caregiver shortage. So I see this as one of the bright areas, one of the best areas of robotics right now. Yeah, why is that? Is that th there's just fewer people that want to do those jobs or there's just not enough people to fill those jobs? You froze up, Michael. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we're having a little, little bit of an internet connection there. Yeah, I was just asking on the uh, caretaker robots, you know, why, why aren't there enough human caretakers? Is it just people don't want to do the job or is it uh, just not enough people? Uh, it's mainly because of aging demographics. So we have, you know, we have a perfect storm uh, of aging societies right now across the world, mostly industrialized societies uh, in the Far East, uh, North America and Europe, uh, where uh, birth rates are falling at the same time that many, many people are aging into their later years. And so, you know, the number of caregivers per capita is steadily shrinking. 
and it's a real crisis in places like Japan already. And, and not and unsurprisingly, they're one of the early adapters of robotic technology. They they love robots in Japan, and uh, they <laughs> use them in all kinds of ways. But they they use them in nursing homes. We have them in some nursing homes here too, but not not on as widespread a basis. But I think eventually we will. Um, you know, caregiving is a tough job. It's low pay. Not many people want to do it. That's another factor. Yeah. What is what? What do some of these robots do in hospitals in Japan? They they uh, one of the biggest things they do is provide companionship. They help people. They lead people in exercises. Um, they deal with people with dementia. They're very, very good at, at working with people with dementia. And some of them, in this respect, are in the shape of animals, uh, furry, very lifelike, moving, animated animals. And um, they, they have the effect on a dementia patient, for example. They tend to have the same effect as a living animal would have on them as far as soothing their agitation, uh, keeping them, helping them to feel grounded. Um, so they do a lot of things. They also deliver things. They deliver trays. They deliver medicines. Um, they provide, um, and this is controversial in my opinion, they provide constant surveillance uh, so that people, uh, you know, these robots can be operated remotely. And so you can have an adult child or person in a nursing home work in a person in a, in a nursing home constantly surveying you know what you're doing at any given time and this is being done in the name of safety obviously um but you know it can also be seen as an unbearable burden to an older person living in their home for example and they have a tear getting robot, and their adult children have access to it, and they can remotely control it. So the loss of privacy, I think, is a real issue here and will be going forward. But they do a lot of <laughs> things. <I'll say. laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, I just thought of a good use. You could have them as prison guards to watch over potentially suicidal uh, prisoners like Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> where his guards <laughs> apparently were fell asleep or they were online screwing around and they weren't paying attention <laughs> unless he actually killed himself, which I don't think, <laughs> but, but the, the robot would solve that problem. It would, and it would solve it better than just having the camera in the courier of the ceiling. It, it would, uh, right. it will, it would alert people, you know, if something was going on that shouldn't be going on. So, um, there's, there's some uses of this technology that, I think we really want to, uh, you know, insure ourselves against and try to manage and try to regulate. So, uh, and privacy is a big one. Yeah. All right. So explain large learning language models and chat GPT and all that. Where does that fall into this sequence? Well, chat GPT and other uh, generative AI chatbots use uh, uh, use deep learning, uh, which means that you know their 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 brains, so to speak, are modeled somewhat on the human brain uh, with you know layers of you know technological neurons, so to speak, and they can communicate with each other and they and they do process information. So the thing that makes them so very, very useful is that they're able to ingest huge amounts of, of human created, you know, material, whether it's reading material, videos, uh, gaze, uh, emails, whatever, they, they accumulate uh, a huge amount of uh, data and they're able to identify patterns in, in this data. So through this, the next step for chatbots is that they can take human language, written language, and after digesting a lot of it, they can make predictions based on probability, statistical probability of what phrase or sentence should follow a previous phrase or sentence. So they're, they're using, they're not creating anything per se, 
um, they're using a lot of human generated data and then they're rearranging it a little bit. And that's kind of what they do, but it creates an illusion, uh, you know, that that is very compelling for some people that, you know, these are intelligent conversations going on here. And, and in reality, they're not. But... Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I was trying the Gemini program and it's pretty bad, I think. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they're just going to have to, maybe that's just not as good as the, the open AI chat GPT programs. But as all you, as you saw problems. the news. Yeah. Oh, I say all of them have problems and, and very significant problems with accuracy. And, and uh, I'm a little concerned at the rapid adoption, you know, of some of these uh, chatbots in, in various professions and, and, you know, including journalism and you know, what I essentially do myself. Um, because of that lack of accuracy, they really don't have a lot of reliability and it seems to be the whole reason to use a technology like that in that kind of context would be because it's reliable. Um, so we have a long way to go before it really takes over the world. If it ever <laughs> gets stop. I, I'm not one of those AI doomsayers. I think it's just another tool. Uh, I go mm -hmm. with Kevin Kelly on that. Uh, I don't think they're going to turn us into paper clips or any of that ridiculous uh. arguments. Um, you know, the Gemini thing, this was, I mean, it was so bad. It was just embarrassing. You know, show us the uh, images of the founding fathers and it's, you know, anybody but white males, you know, it's, or, or, uh, or a Nazi. And they, you know, they show these, you know, I don't know, Native American Nazis and female, uh, you know, uh -huh. black Nazis or whatever. It's just crazy, just ridiculous. Obviously they're still very much just dependent on the programming, you know, in, in other words, they're not. They're not becoming sentient beings or anything remotely like that, thinking for themselves. You know, when I just ask questions, it just like, who, you know, what is what is Michael Shermer's position on whatever religion? It basically just repeats the Wikipedia entry for me on, you know, on that particular topic. It's no better than Wikipedia. Yeah, I opinion. agree. Yeah, totally so agree with that. Why is it? Why is it that the AI doomsayers, the robo apocalypse is coming, people? Why have they gotten so much media attention? And, and what is your take on that? Oh, I, I think it has a lot to, well, it's, it's kind of an unsettling comment on the reasoning powers of some of our, you know, highest placed individuals in tech, in the tech industry, uh, that these kind of crazy, loopy theories are coming out and actually adhered to by some people who seem to be pretty well respected in the field. Um, I don't, I don't think that uh, this is, this is going to be, uh, you know, doom, doom saying works into the journalistic news cycle. You know, it, if it believes it leads, I'm sure you've heard that expression. And it's just the nature of journalism to want to put something out that's sensational that gets eyeballs and clicks. So I think that's kind of what's driving this. This and the fact that, you know, a lot of the people who are, are ostensibly very involved in developing the technology um, have a limited understanding of the big picture of what they're doing and, and what it can do and what it cannot do. Yeah, I mean, I was just astounded to see Eliezer Yud. Sorry, I just butchered his last name. Yudkowski, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote that Time Magazine op-ed that you know that ChatGPT and all that mm -hmm. uh, is going to lead to the entire extinction of all life on Earth. You know, but but how? What's the pathway other than nuclear war because it created a fake video of Putin launching his, his nukes. So we launch ours and something like that. It's the only thing I could think of is if there's no checks and balances in between a fake video and, you know, launching our nukes. I've had a loss too, Michael. And, and that's the only pathway that I can envision as far as how robots could actually destroy the world and destroy the human race. Uh, first of all, robots would have to have volition. They would have to want to do that, which is something that we're very, very far from, um, you know, and, and it's just not heavy. So I don't see any 
you know, unless I'm missing something really esoteric here, I don't see any pathway from here to there. Um, and I'm not sure why or how it would even take place given robots have no volition. So I, I'm not, well, I, I'm in the middle here. I'm not a doomsayer. I'm not a person who believes in the salvation of the human race through AI. I don't think that robotics and AI are going to solve every problem that we have. I, I just don't think they have that capacity. Uh, but somewhere in the middle, uh, there are a lot of very interesting uses for these machines. And they can do a lot for us. But the problem is we need to keep it in perspective. That's the issue there. It's us. Right. 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 It's like they're so smart. They can do all these really good things for us. But at the same time, they're so dumb. They'll 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 kill us all because when we say, you know, we want to eliminate cancer and they'll they'll deduce that the best way to do that is to eliminate all humans. I mean, what this is so dumb. I mean, <laughs> how would anybody program it to think like that? Uh, I just don't get it. Well, they call it the alignment problem, right? That that uh, that at some point when it hits the singularity, the AIs will be so you know orders of magnitude smarter than us, many orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. that 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 they will then somehow develop volition. You know, it reminds me of that Sidney Harris cartoon. You know, and then a miracle happens. You know, the equations on the chalkboard, and then a miracle happens. And more equations. I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. how is it that the robot is going to suddenly just miraculously develop volition and emotions and want to kill all of us, or or just do it inadvertently because it doesn't care about us? I, I just I don't see how that could even happen. And then when you think about it, you know, that would have to arise out of the narrow type of intelligence that uh, AI has, you know, which is basically computational intelligence. Even though it has linguistic intelligence, it's not true linguistic intelligence because it doesn't understand the words it's processing. It can only, you know, uh, identify patterns and, and, and work within patterns that are presented to it. The, the, the main, you know, talent of AI, I think, is, is computational. And just having, you know, that's nowhere near creating volition. Now, how would you, I just don't see, I, I, think, I think volition is a much more complex thing. Uh, you know, then then we appreciate if you really think about it. it and it involves a lot of critical thinking and uh, moral values and things like that uh, that robots don't have and that AI doesn't have to date. So I don't see the pathway either. I totally agree with you. We could all be surprised. <laughs> you know, that's happened before. <laughs> well, but even, even, if the, even if we're surprised, you know, how long before the regulatory state puts their foot down on these companies? It says, all right, now you've caused actual harm. My example is, let's say I push that little button on the right side of my steering wheel and say to my Tesla, navigate LAX. And it automatically takes me on the, the, the best um, least trafficked roads. It monitors traffic and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, what if it went up on the sidewalk and mowed down a bunch of pedestrians to avoid traffic? You know, how long would it be before e the government stepped in to shut down Elon's company? <laughs> you know, it's like, this just can't, this is not going to happen. It's just not possible in the world we live in. I don't think it's going to happen either. And I, I think that, you know, we already uh, are really kind of burdened with a lot of issues, even at the stage of uh, self-diving cars, you know, because, you know, what you're, the scenario you're talking about where a self-diving car uh, who drives over or several pedestrians or kills, you know, even one person, um, there's the question of liability. There's the question of who's at fault. There's the question of what rights do victims have, uh, you know, to get, you know, whatever science, you know, uh, monetary uh, compensation for their damages or whatever. Um, it's already very complicated, and we haven't even thought that one through yet. All right, so talk about um, robot soldiers. Uh, maybe this is the dark side, but at least it's maybe uh, they're being wrecked rather than people dying. 
Well, you know, the the amazing thing about this topic is that the U.S. military is already using a lot of robots in combat and in military activities, and um, way more than we realize. The ones we hear about are drones. So we hear about drones, you know, because they interact with, because they engage with the enemy and essentially, you know, create real damage. Uh, but there's all kinds of uh, robots being employed by the uh, U.S. military that make the job of a soldier safer, more able. They can do things like they have heat sensors so they can see if there are people inside buildings, you know, which we can't do with any of our our other technology. Um, they can carry weapons. They can uh, detonate uh, roadside bombs. Uh, they can patrol the territory and uh, warn people if there's a radiological uh, danger. There, there's all kinds of uses that they have, and they kind of stand between uh, soldiers and and uh, extreme bodily energy, uh, injury or death uh, on a regular basis. And uh, it, it's, it's something that uh, I think we all need to be a little more aware of because uh, again, it's being implemented very rapidly. Uh, we can assume that, you know, once a technology exists that has a use a use in the military realm, uh, there's bound to be an arms race uh, for other countries and even our adversaries uh, to to engage in that and to develop the same kind of weapons. But um, and there are a lot of issues. I mean, it's a very multifaceted issue. Warism is a complex issue, and it's it's hard and complex for hum, human beings to make the right decisions in warfare. Robots don't come anywhere near being able to make those kinds of decisions, those kinds of, you know, multifaceted, uh, deep-thinking uh, decisions. Um, so, you know, it's something we need to be aware of. It's happening already. Um, there's pros and cons to it. I don't know where you want to go with this, but I mean, there's there's many pros and cons to, on both sides of the issue. Well, I was just thinking like drones, it seems kind of cold to, you know, that some, there's some, some operators in Arizona somewhere controlling a drone in Iraq uh, mm -hmm. and killing people. But on the other hand, you know, war is hell and it's better than carpet bombing an entire city to just try to mm -hmm. get the right people or the right facility you want to destroy. So I, you know, I, if you want to say there's improvement or progress in war, that would be an example of that. I mean, if you want to talk about the evils of war, the problem is not technology. The problem is people or politics mm -hmm. or you know, mm -hmm. nationalism or tribalism or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is true. This is true. And people, uh, people have a long way to go before they actually, uh, become civilized enough, in my opinion, uh, that war becomes unthinkable. But I think in the meantime, wars will become far more automated and, the, and a lot more technology will be used. And I agree with you. Th this can be much more surgical than having thousands of men, you know, marching out towards each other on a field or ambushing each other <laughs> from behind buildings. Um you know, robots, uh, even drones, can gather all kinds of uh, critical information to tell about a target. The thing that drones can't do, and that the danger with them, though, is that when they get into some situations in countries in the Middle East, for example, where you have a terror, you have terrorists who mingle with the civilian population and dress and look and behave like just regular people for the most part, and they could easily be overlooked or because they're in the highly dense places like, like say, Rafa, you know, right now, uh, you had, uh, supposedly you have, you know, terrorists in there, you know, completely mingled with the civilian population. Um, you know, if, if a drone made a bad step, a bad decision, uh, they could slaughter innocent civilians. And this would just reverberate, you know, through throughout, you know, the country, throughout the world, because people would then start to, you know, say, 
you know, it, it would affect the politics, let me put it that way. It would deeply affect the politics and the decision making about using these these technologies and about going to ultimately about going to war in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see us spend more money on the game theory analysis and uh, the politics of conflict and and peace studies and so on to avoid the problem in the first place that the technology exactly. has developed to solve. I remember back in the uh, reading uh, when I was in psych, psych uh, graduate school reading about Skinner's experiments with pigeons guiding missiles. So the, you put a pigeon inside the missile and there's a camera with a screen and it sees and it pecks left or right, left or right to direct it to where it's supposed to go. This never uh, developed in anything. It was just an interesting experiment. Uh, but in a way, if you're a poor country and you don't have the money to develop uh, uh, weapons like guided missiles, you just get people to do it. You use ideology or religion or whatever, political affiliation and, and, and tribalism and commitment to get people to want to be suicide terrorists or suicide bombers because people have hands and feet and brains and it, 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 they are essentially robots. That, that you can get to do whatever you want them to do and die for it if you give them the right ideology. This is true. And, um, you know, there's an asymmetry to war already in the world, you know, because you have uh, nations like the United States that have all this amazing technology and are able to, uh, you know, be both surgical but also lethal on a on a scale at, at a level. You know that that outpaces that of the your opponent. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there are there are societies is a, a world where um, human life is not as highly valued. Even I mean, you know, it's it it's something where you know there's different cultures and different ideologies around all this. Um, but war is already asymmetrical in this sense. And, um, you know, if you think about the justice of it, you know, the, the ratio of soldiers killed on each side, uh, then we start to have a real ethical issue there as well. Yeah. All right, let's talk about your chapter, Love in the Time of Robots. <laughs> here here you, you talk about David Levy, the... British computer specialist who made a splash with his 2007 book, Love and Sex with Robots, The Evolution of Human-Robot Relationships. And he thinks that sex robots will be an acceptable alternative for men who are too shy or for other reasons are unable to form connections with real women. As he told Scientific American that, uh, that, that love robots could be the answer to all those who feel lost and hopeless without relationships. To let them know there will come a time when they can form relationships with robots. There's 8 billion people. <laughs> how about just uh, some psychological training on how to interact with other people <laughs> rather than a robot? That was actually my conclusion as well. And, you know, there is a ready-made market for sex robots. And um, that would, of course, automatically be uh, the men who are, you know, really into sex dolls. And, you know, that's kind of their exclusive, you know, outlet, their, their sexual and emotional outlet is with sex dolls, and I think those people will very easily transfer those habits and those interests onto robots. Um, but for the average person, you know, unless you have some really compelling reason why you simply cannot form a connection, either physically or psychologically, uh, you're probably better off learning relationship skills, you know, learning good, uh, you know, communication skills or whatever it is you need to learn uh, to connect with other human beings in order to really flourish as a human being. Because it's those real relationships that continuously challenge you to be empathetic, to grow, uh, to learn, uh, and and to flourish. Uh, and a doll or a sex robot is not going to do that for you. They're going to tell you everything that you want to hear. Uh, they're going to, uh, you know, cater themselves to you tirelessly. Uh, you know, they are, they'll provide an outlet to some extent. But you're not going to flourish. You're, you're pretty much in a rut. 
uh, when you get into these relationships, and that becomes your only outlet. It seems to me that uh, these sex robots would be fairly expensive. Why not just hire a prostitute? Because essentially it's the same thing, right? Like I said, this is this is something I agree with you. I totally do. But again, you would think it, it's counterintuitive. You would think that people everywhere would prefer... A, a living, breathing, warm human being in their love life, but there is evidence to show that that's not universal. And in different cultures, I mean, in in South Korea, for example, um, you can. There are men, uh, and it's a thriving business. It's a thriving form of prostitution, if you want to call it that. Uh, who check in to pay a fee, check into a hotel room. And they're supplied with a computer and uh, copious amounts of pornography. And that's their sexual experience, and they pay for it. And it's actually widespread. It's not uh, a small you know, sliver of the population. I don't remember exactly how widespread it is, but it's significant. So um, there are people in other parts of the world and in our part of the world who relate to technology who simply have an insurmountable difficulty, you know, at, at, to making connections with real members of the opposite sex. And it's usually men, you know, who are very isolated emotionally and don't have the skills or know how to reach out. And, um, you know, to me, that that's, that's kind of a sad thing. And I, I would like to see you know, these people, rather than being lulled into uh, a complacent rut, you know, with a machine uh, to learn the skills they need to actually humanly connect. And then they can truly flourish in life. And that's that's my opinion. I'm sure there are others who see it differently and who will say, oh, that's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Who cares? You know, it's just one part of your life. Uh, you have this whole other life. You know, who cares what you do behind closed doors is your business. And that's true. And I, I mean, on a, on a level, I agree with that too. But I don't think it's for most people, for the vast majority of people, it's, it's the most, the most advantageous outcome. So is to be in a relationship with a sex robot. I don't, I think they're able to have a richer, more interesting and, and uh, truly fulfilling life than that if they had the problem skills. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's a human problem, not a technology problem or human psychology problem. In this example you just gave from the South Korean uh, um, system there, that these men are checking into a hotel and there's a sex robot there or just pornography? or Just, what, or just, what, what are just, they doing? A, com just a computer and pornography. Well, can't they do that at home? <laughs> what, do have, what do they have to pay for that for? Well, <laughs> or they just don't have computers at home or something. Um, it's the setting. I think they find very un uninhibited. Um, it's certainly, uh, you know, it's the whole setup, the way it's packaged, the way it's marketed to them is an erotic experience. Um, and it's appealing to more men than you would think. I personally would have thought, you know, no, people wouldn't do that. There's not even, there's not an embodied robot there. There, There's probably a chat bot there talking dirty to you. Uh, but, you know, there's, right. there's no embodied, you know, anything there. And, and yet, and you're paying for it. You're paying for the room and you're paying for the time. Uh, so I, you know, I don't understand it myself, but uh, it, it, it's a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon in the world. There are men in Japan who have married a hologram. There's a little, what? you know, black. There's a, they actually have married a hologram that represents a little a teenage anime girl in a glass dome. And the hologram is just floating there in the center of the dome and it converses and it, it's like a chat bot and it's programmed to act like a girlfriend, like a real girlfriend, um, and to have, you know, say, you know, affectionate things and, you know, 
pretend to care? What kind of day did you have? It'll do things like that for you. And there are men who the company that makes them generates a marriage license. And uh, there over three, after the time I wrote the book, over 3,000 of those marriage licenses had been purchased. And I wrote about a man who had actually had a ceremony, had a, had a wedding and everything, and and had considered himself in a faithful, monogamous relationship that he thought was very satisfying to him. And he was not even interested in branching out and, and engaging with real women on that level. And I guess that would be because, what, the sex bot is never going to say no or is only going to say positive things. I mean, in real relationships, you never know. Maybe the person, your spouse doesn't want to have sex tonight, or maybe she'll leave you in the future if you're a, a total asshole. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a give and take, and there's some risk, and you don't know. The future is not completely 100% known. But if it's, a, if it's a bot that's just programmed to only ever say nice things, and you never have a fight or a dispute or disagreement, <laughs> and there's zero chance she'll ever say no, I don't know. That just seems so artificial. It does. Um, but, you know, you, you hit on it when you when you said, uh, you know, you, you can't be rejected. So you, there's no risk. There's no actual emotional risk involved here. And there are people in this world. I, I spoke to a, a, a Stanford psychologist who was one of the uh, doctors who worked on a chatbot called Wobot, which delivers cognitive behavioral therapy it's a therapy robot um so you know what she said and it sticks out of my is that there's a lot of noise in human relationships and that noise is the fear of rejection so there are many many people who are very fragile emotionally in that respect and um have need some kind of technological shield between themselves and others and uh, it exists and is a growing phenomenon. It's something that, and this has been studied extensively by a psychologist at MIT, her name is Sherry Turkle. And she spent years and years studying the interactions between children and young people and uh, technology, whether it's robots or chatbots or um, any other kind of technology that they, that they social media even was one of them. And what she has found is that as people, and especially this is this is much more true for the younger generations, uh, as they develop the habit of interacting technologically, uh, as it, their social behavior becomes mediated by technology to an extent that uh, they they would rather send a text than pick up the phone and call somebody. They would not pick up the phone and call somebody because they they have so such low confidence in their social skills and their ability to interact on an acceptable level uh, that they shy away from it. And so what happens over time is that those social skills really atrophy and it feeds on itself. It's a, it's, it's a feedback loop. You know, you, the more you, you interact with technology, the more you lose confidence. And the more you lose confidence, the more you interact with technology. And then it kind of takes on a life of its own. And I, I think that's happened. If that guy, I think of that with some of these men in Japan who have married uh, a hologram or who see themselves as being in a long-term relationship with an anime character. Uh, and they actually have a name for themselves. They call themselves technosexuals. So they, they, it's, a, it's a subculture. <laughs> And, and it's, and it's going to be a growing subculture. I, I'm convinced of that. I, I do believe that because it's just, you know, it's the path of least resistance to be in an, to not be in a demanding emotional relationship, to be in a, in a so-called relationship where you are always approved of, you're always accepted, you cannot be rejected. Um, it, it's very seductive. It, and, and and I think it, for those of us who think we couldn't get sucked into something like that, um, I have interacted uh, with robots, and I can see how utterly compelling it can be to to really start to believe that you're connecting with an with a conscious being. 
and um, the illusion is becoming more compelling all the time with advance of technology. So, technosexuality, <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah, I guess maybe it's it's that same phenomenon of uh, a, kind of a theory of mind, but essentialism of putting an essence into a thing like the volleyball Wilson in uh, the Tom Hanks movie. Um, what's the name of that movie? Not uh, Le Left Beat? No, not Left Alone. Uh, you remember the movie where he's strand stranded on the desert island? Oh, right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he, and he forms an attachment to Wilson, the volleyball, because there's mm -hmm. nobody else there. But in fact, psychologists like Paul Bloom have written about this that, um, and Bruce Hood also, uh, that we imbue physical objects with a being or essence. Uh, Bruce's famous experiments on this is, would you wear Hitler's jacket? Uh, mm. And most people, oh, Oh no! Oh God, no! How about Mister Rogers' sweater? Oh, Mister Rogers' sweater. That would be a nice thing. Yes, I would wear that. Or the, I think he another one. He had Jeffrey Dahmer's sweater that he oh, wore man. when he killed these boys. Now it, it, he didn't really have the sweater. He just made it made up stories. But I had a dry clean, and so would you? Would you put it on? No one wanted to put it on because it it seemed like the essence of evilness would you know uh, kind of ooze out With of the Stephen's sweater. Or or would you put yeah. it on? Would you put uh, it on? Probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> yeah, it would just be creepy. You know, it's, maybe it's part mm -hmm. of that uncanny valley or is, is something mm -hmm. like that, uh, the psychology. that Another one he did was um, he had Brad Pitt's shirt, uh, like a T-shirt that he had worn. He didn't really have this, but he, he, he put it on eBay for sale, washed versus unwashed. And the, uh, the unwashed one got the higher bid. Because, you know, these people like, ooh, the essence of Brad Pitt. Oh, I want that. <laughs> In the t-shirt, right? <laughs> um, you know, so, but but there is something to that. You know, there was that famous t-shirt test. Um, these uh, college co-eds, you know, would, you know they, they had, the psychologists had these guys wear these shirts for a day and then had women smell them and, and just ask, you know, the different ones, is this somebody you'd want to go out with? just based on the smell. And, you know, they got interesting results about genetic diversity and things like that. I forget the exact details of this, but, but that, you know, smell does touch on an essence of somebody, you know, you have a sense of them, uh, along with the other senses and so on, you know? So I think, cause you open your book with this story, uh, uh in early 1900s, the artist Oscar Kokoschka, is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. his name? Mm -hmm. Kokoschka was the blonde, rakishly handsome infant terrible of the Viennese art scene. He fell in love with Alma Mahler, the beautiful dark-haired widow of the famous composer Gustav Mahler. Uh, and the recently bereaved Alma was one of the most desired women in all of Vienna. The two of them plunged headfirst into a tumultuous love affair. But anyway, then she broke it off after a while, and he couldn't control his passions and jealousy and so on. So he uh, then approached a doll maker, Pick up the story there. He had a, a doll made that looked like her. <laughs> so he approached a, a German doll maker who was well known for her realistic, you know, depictions. Uh, and um, he had very specific, uh, you know, specifications. He wanted her to create a doll for him uh, that basically resembled, and in his mind, in his emotional repertoire, you know, represented. Uh, Aunt Alma, his his loved one, uh, who he could no longer be with. So um, he had all these, you know, really uh, you know, detailed uh, requirements, and she and and she did her best. Now, if you've seen a picture of this doll, you'd say, "I would never imagine that to be a human being in a million years." And in fact, it's pretty creepy to look at. But uh, that wasn't the case for Oscar. Oscar moved her into his house. He had servants dress her, attend to her. Um, he took her for carriage rides in his carriage. Um, he would take her to cafes and seat her opposite him. And then you carry on an imaginary conversation with her. And he even carries her to the opera, to maybe the opera, and seated her next to him in the opera box. And conveyed to the world, you know, you know uh, that to everybody, 
uh, that this was his woman now, and this was his love and his mate. Um, and he got really deeply involved in this for many, many years. Interestingly, it didn't last forever because Oscar eventually was able to work out his, his to project his emotional issues onto the doll. The issues that he had with Alma, he was able to work out through projection with the doll. And eventually he ended up destroying the doll. The doll was destroyed. Um, but, you know, it, it, it sounds crazy and it sounds like this guy is completely out of his mind. You know, this is not the sort of you know, psychological maybeth uh, that we ourselves would be uh, uh, given to. Um, but you know, the research, as I demonstrate hopefully later in the book, as it goes on in the book, is that, you know, we all like to think of ourselves as eminently rational beings. And our bodies and our hardwiring and our emotions, especially our social emotions, say something very different about us. So I try to key in on the, the actual research on how all these interactions with artificial things actually play out in real life with real people, educated people, people of all ages, people who should know better, so to speak. Um, and like I said, it's very, very compelling. It, it clicks into, uh, you know, the matrix, the psychological matrix that we have in our minds already from birth and from social acculturation. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, let's talk about the future wrap up here. Uh, uh, give us your projection of the next, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years. People like uh, Elon with his Neuralink company. Is that the name of the company? Yeah, Neuralink. Mm -hmm. um, ra rather than, you know, their robots are going to replace us or destroy us or whatever, just tools just to help us. Again, just having a chip in your brain to control your uh, motor cortex if you're Parkinson's or, you know, any of the other examples. You know, these, these, this seems like good things. Um, what, what can we expect in the coming rest of the 21st century? So I think there are some good things here. Um, uh, you know, I think life for disabled people will become a lot better uh, because they can have uh, potentially a, a robot, a humanoid robot in the home with them that can do all kinds of things to help them. Uh, and I think it'll be better for people who have autism, for example, uh, because there are robots uh, that are trained and, and programmed to run autism pro uh, programs with children. Uh, and if you have one in the home, even if you rented one periodically in the home, uh, they can help these children uh, overcome a lot of their issues with autism. Um, I think a lot of the uh, really uh, boring drudgery of life is going to go the other way. Uh, is not going to be part of our, our future lives, especially in household type of duties. Um, I think women are going to be big beneficiaries uh, of, uh, of household robots that are, that are very, uh, you know, intricately abled on how to navigate the home and do do some different tasks around the home, as well as provide companionship uh, and supervision of children and caregiving for an elderly family member, that sort of thing. So I think life in a lot of ways will get much better. Um, you know, but there, there are other changes that we need to really keep tab on. One of them is that our culture will change because of the presence of robots, the widespread presence of robots and that people will be interacting with them, you know, everywhere from it's whether in the home, in their workplace, in the retail environment, uh, everywhere. They'll, I think that uh, the robots will, that we will become more robotic, that robots will become more human-like, and we will become more robotic. And I base that on the, uh, the fact that in research, um, people tend to consistently overestimate the intelligence of robots and to defer to them. So even when robots are incorrect, we tend to really overestimate the validity of, of what they say and what they do. So um, when there's that kind of, uh, you know, feeling, you have emulation. And people will, I think, just naturally start to emulate robots as they consider them a tier on a level, a very intelligent, 
even somewhat possibly infallible uh, tier. And, and so people will start to emulate them, and I, and I think that will change things. Um, but I, I think in a lot of ways life will uh, get easier. I think people will adapt to this. They'll have more time. Um, they'll have less privacy because these things have sensors and cameras and recorders and, and all that all the time. Um, we will accept those things or not accept them. I think it, it's up to us to kind of start thinking now about what are our core values and what do we want to maintain here? You know, what do we need robots to do and what do we not want them to do for us? Um, I think it's, it's, it's a question of us keeping a very bright dividing line in our minds between what is real and what is fantasy. And robots are going to take fantasy, you know, to a whole other level, whether it's in entertainment and sex and relationships, uh, in learning, in education, in childcare, they're going to take fantasy to, you know, a, a level that it's never been before. And I think that we can easily be dazzled and a little bit, uh, our brains can get a little bit short-circuited when we're that dazzled by a technology. So we're going to have to keep a grip on ourselves and, and maintain a sense of the perspective. <laughs> well said, Eve. Perfect place to end right there. Thank you for your work. Thanks for the book. What's next on your research and writing agenda? Um, I am really considering doing something on the subject of um, AI-powered social change, social contagion. And this is where, again, we're having the end of the book, oh, <laughs> leading to the yeah. beginning of the next book. So social contagion as driven by artificial intelligence. So that's kind of where my thinking is right now, and I want to explore that a lot more deeply. And I think, you know, in the span of time it would take to write a book like that, uh, probably there it, it would be outdated in six months because, yeah, you know, things right. are moving so quickly. Um, but that's, that fascinates me. So maybe that's where I'll go next. Yeah, that's important. There's We've covered it a lot on this show because uh, there's quite a few books out on this already. Uh, the problem of social media, the spike in uh, teen uh, depression, anxiety, cutting, suicidal ideation, and so on. Apparently, it's it's quite the problem, and there's a lot of people scrambling to figure out what the cause is: screen time, or social media, as a Facebook, or TikTok, Instagram. You know, fear of being left out, fear of missing out. You know, all these things, but also uh, other co possible possible causes. So, I don't think we really know the answer to that yet. Uh, but it's an interesting, important topic. So, yeah, pursue that. That sounds good. All right. Thanks so much.